we want to hear the stories from the courses that you've taught. Whether in a lab, a classroom, kitchen, on Zoom, or in a shop. Drawing on your expertise, we'll ask the probing questions. What goes right and what goes wrong when teaching your favorite lesson? Hello, everybody, and welcome back to My Favorite Lesson, a podcast hosted by Teaching and Learning at Conestoga College. My name is Dr. Lauren Spring, and I am here today with Ross Harwell, who is a professor in our Hearing Instrument Specialist program. Hi, Ross. Hi, Lauren. I have to tell you, I am so excited for this lesson because you are our first faculty member who's brought props. You have, <laughs> we're sitting here in the studio and um, we've got a guitar, there's a really cool looking trombone, there's this really neat sort of pail of water and, and something else that's going to go into it, so I cannot wait. It's exciting. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm cheating a little bit by bringing all this stuff in, but, uh, no. but uh, hopefully it'll be enjoyable. Not at all. No, I, I welcome it. It's, it's really brightened up the space here. Um, so hi, Ross. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I've um, never done a podcast before. Well, you're already doing great. So, so uh, um, we're, we're going to be just fine. I want to hear a little bit about you before we get into this, this lesson that promises to be impressive. Um, let us know a little bit about you. What brought you to Conestoga? Your professional training. I know. I know some details, but but share with our listeners. Um, well, I so I'm a, uh, I teach uh, like you said in the hearing instrument specialist program, which is part of health sciences, and uh, <clears throat> I've been at Conestoga for about I think I'm almost almost ten years, nine years Great, full time. Okay. Um, and before that, so I'm an I'm an audiologist, and before I uh, came to Conestoga, I had a practice of my own um, in Toronto for about five or six years. And then before that, I, um, I was working for a big uh, hearing aid manufacturer. Mm. So hearing instrument specialist, audiologist, you know, we are, we're, we're, you know, what we do is, is help people with hearing loss um, and uh, uh, fit hearing aids primarily. And uh, so uh, uh, I was doing that, I was doing that clinically for a long time. And then I decided I wanted to, to try something different. So I came here. Neat. And so as an audiologist, when you had your um, your practice, mm -hmm. you would see people of all ages, I assume? Pretty much. Uh, my practice was mostly adults, um, but uh, but I would see some kids. Uh, one of the differences between a hearing instrument specialist, which is what we teach at Conestoga, and an audiologist is audiologists tend to see kids more mm -hmm. than uh, hearing instrument specialists. So it's, it's a bit more specialized training with, um, with uh, children. Uh, in audiology, uh, but my own practice, I was more of a, I was more of an adult, adult-based uh, uh, clinician. Okay, and so are there some diagnostics involved? I guess as an audiologist, yep. then where yep, yeah, folks sure. come in and uh, yep. So we're we're basically, um, you know, we have to determine uh, people's degree of hearing loss and the type of hearing loss that they have, and then essentially we're responsible for whatever you know whatever treatment plan. Uh, is going to is going to help them whether that is hearing aids, which it often is, but it could be could be other things as well. Okay, and so you eventually transitioned to Conestoga. I what, did. What made you think that teaching might be something that you would be interested in? Well, I mean, I so my I mean, just to go back further, not to not to not to go to the beginning of my life, but my before before audiology, I was actually in music, and and so I did some teaching when I was when I was in music. Um, and, and I always loved teaching. Also, when I worked at the hearing aid manufacturer, one of my jobs, I was, I was responsible for training. So I did a lot of, I did a lot of teaching. So it was more adult, adult teachings, you know, similar to what we do here. Um, and I would, uh, uh, so I'd go out and do big training, training seminars and things like that and, and train mm -hmm. other clinicians on the products that, that we sold, uh, uh, the manufacturer sold. So I, I've always, I've always really liked it. Um, you know, I always kind of liked public speaking and things like that. So, um, so I thought this is, this is kind of a perfect, a perfect mix of everything, I think. Really neat. And um, how did you come to Conestoga? Was it sort of there was a posting and you applied or had you heard about the program? You know, my my colleague, uh, Calvin Staples, uh, and I go back a long, long way. And uh, um, the the gentleman who actually started the program at Conestoga uh, finally left. 
and mm. and and they were in need of a, a new clinician or sorry a new uh, a new professor and he said we had kind of talked about it for years before that and finally he called me up and said oh there's a there's a job opening so I came uh. and did the interview and I was lucky enough to get the job and how did you find those first few days of teaching obviously it was hard yeah <laughs> sorry did you say Different. days did you say <laughs> days or months <laughs> First couple of years were hard. <laughs> it was hard. Yeah. Like it was hard, and and I was actually it was, just, it was actually quite a bit harder than I than I thought. You know, even the 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 you know what I'll talk about today is is something that you know it, it's part it's part of my my acoustics course. Okay. So I teach an acoustics course, which is you know which is uh, you know how sound works and what is sound and 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 uh, um, how we perceive sound and things like that. And, and that was something I had learned, certainly in my own training way back when, but, but getting up and teaching it 20 years later is a different, that's a different animal. Hmm. Um, and it was, it was hard. And there were, there were some, uh, there were some difficult, there were some difficult days where I thought, I don't know if I can do this. Um, Cause it was, it was a lot, right? It was a lot of, a lot of courses and hmm. um, a lot of hours and a lot of prep. And uh, it was, it was difficult. So. Yeah, those those listening from outside of Conestoga might not realize actually how many courses our faculty do teach yeah. <laughs> in a given semester, yeah. right? How many would you say? You well, know, at most? I mean, it, it varies, but but last semester I had five courses. Wow. Um, and that was that was, and and I most of my had taught before, so it wasn't it wasn't too bad. But but it was it was a lot. That was a lot. That's a lot of courses. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of um, yeah, it's a lot of preparation. So, yeah, but, but certainly four. You know, it's usually more like four, but uh, but even that, even that. Um, and we do labs, so our our program is is kind of half theory, half labs. Um, so uh, so it's a bit you know there's some practical things as well, but uh, also a fair bit of a fair bit of lecture based theory, which some of which has moved online over the last couple of years. Uh, so we've we've kind of div- we've sort of turned into a bit of a a hybrid program. Okay. Yeah, and we'll get more into that. I'm curious. You mentioned those first hard days or weeks or months. Yeah. <laughs> um, what do you think was different about it then? Because you had some expertise already, you know, when you were training folks, um, when you were working in the manufacturing company. What what was different in the classroom? I, I think it was it was um, I think it was more of not not a not an issue of of the actual teaching or being in front. I didn't mind. I don't mind being in front of the room and being in front of the class. Uh, but I think it was the the degree of knowledge that I needed to dig up, you know, mm-hmm. from my past <laughs> that that I maybe hadn't used for a long time. And that suddenly I went, oh, OK, I have to convey this now. I, I know this mm-hmm. sometimes somewhere in my head. I know this, but I need to know it well enough that I need to convey it uh, in a in a, a meaningful and, and understandable way. Yeah. And, and that's it was hard. It was hard. Some stuff was harder than other. Like the, the things that were a bit more clinically based, where maybe I had a bit more uh, um, recent experience with, that was that was maybe easier. Uh, you know, things like labs and things like that maybe are a bit easier because it was a bit more present in my mind. But but uh, but some of the the background theory stuff, um, I had to go back. And I like it. It's not like I, I enjoy that that part of it. But uh, but I definitely had to go back and re- relearn a well, little bit. Well, and that's a kind of beautiful journey, right? I mean, in teaching and learning, we often talk about how faculty sort of have to have three things, right? They're kind of a subject subject area expert. Then they have some general pedagogical knowledge. Okay, how do I teach in general? What are some of the best practices? But then what you're getting at, I think, is this pedagogical content knowledge. Like, how do I teach this specific thing that I know very well, or you'll know, will know very well by next week when I'm scheduled to teach it, but how right. do I teach this particular thing to this particular group of students? And that's right. a really fine, uh, intricate dance, really. It is, and and <clears throat> you know our program w- is great because it's it's super diverse in terms of where our students come from, mm. um, but it can be challenging as well because we have, you know, we have 17 year olds who are are coming right out of high school or wow. maybe a year after high school, and that will go all the way to foreign trained ear, nose and throat physicians, We're not just not just family. We've had family physicians as well, but actual specialists in hearing wow. who, you know, who have you know, 15 years of experience who have come to Canada and are not able to practice in their in their field here. So they want to do something related and they end up in, a, in our program. Wow. So that's a that's a wide that is a wide range, let me tell you. So it's it's difficult to know, you know, where where am I teaching to? Yeah. Right? 
Yeah, so. I mean, we always talk about, you know, we, we can't just teach to the average student, right? You have to teach the margins, but yep. those are wide margins. They're wide. They're really, <laughs> really, really, really wide, wide margins. Wide margins. Yes, and so how are. do you do it? What, how, do you, how do you figure that out? Um, I, I don't know. I, I think that, I mean, I, one reason I do like it is because, you know, the, the students who are, who maybe have a lot of, have more experience or a little bit older as well. I mean, we have a lot of people in second and third careers as well who come mm-hmm. through, you know, they're, they're, I think we have a nice group. It's usually not a huge group and they, and they help each other mm-hmm. as well. Right. So, so it, it is kind of a community, I think, um, every year I'm, I'm, I'm quite impressed at how that they all, they all get together and, and help each other. Uh, but it, it's, yeah, it's difficult, I think. And do you find, can that be a bit of a relief to you or does it in some way threaten your position to have other experts oh, in the room? Say? Oh, believe me, the first time I had a foreign trained ear, nose and throat <laughs> physician listening to my, my lecture on something that he probably knew much more about than <laughs> I did. It does. It does. It, it does boost my anxiety a little bit. But mm. you know what? They're all. Everyone's super supportive and 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 respectful. And and so I, I've never had an issue. And you know what? Sometimes we'll even. You know, there've been times where we'll take take one of those people and say, you know what? Why don't you get up and talk about? Mm this aspect of the middle ear or whatever it is where you, you know, used to do surgery on it. Wow. Um, so, so, you know, you can use it like that as well, I think. So, but yes, it was definitely, it, it was definitely something that I was, I was aware of. Um, but, but it's, it's always been really great. Well, and a, and a credit to you, I think too, for embracing that, right? Like that a lot of folks would find that challenging and then saying, wait a second, let's make the best of this situation yeah. and yeah, yeah, share knowledge. Wow. And so those folks, I can understand, you know, maybe folks who've been foreign trained physicians, as you're saying, specialists and need these credentials as they're coming to make their life in Canada. What do you think those younger students, like those 17 year olds right out of high school, what do you think might draw them to this particular program? You know, I mean, we, we certainly go around every every year. You know, the first class will always go around and say, you know, what do you, you know, what do you do, what are you doing here anyway? <laughs> um, and I, I think there's a in, in our program, and I, and I think a lot of health sciences, there's just a strong desire to to help people. Hmm. Um, and and uh, it, people, the, there's lots of people who come in, and they and they maybe have uh, relatives who have mm-hmm. hearing loss, who wear hearing aids, and that's how they. That's how they kind of learned about it, and and they're they're interested in in learning more and, and helping other people with hearing loss. We have a lot of people come in who do actually have hearing loss themselves and maybe wear hearing really? aids. Yeah, we've had um, usually every year we have one or two. Um, wow. So uh, so I think I think there's a mix, but I think the 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 thing that maybe um, applies to all of them is that everyone seems to want to be in this helping profession. Huh. So, and how about yourself when you were first drawn to audiology? What what was it that sparked that interest? I think for me it was it was um, I mean it was a little bit of that as well, but it was also the fact that um, I came from a music background. Mm. So so I have my bachelor's degree is in music, and when it became clear that I wasn't going to be a professional musician, um, I I said you know I got to do something. What what do I need to do? <laughs> um, and I kind I actually sort of stumbled on audiology you know later later in my twenties. I mean, I'll tell the I'll tell the ten second story, but I had an injury, so I was a trombone player, okay, um, and I had an injury to my lip. Oh no! And part of the part of the the, the process when I when I went to the well, there's a there's a couple of um, uh, performing arts uh, uh, physicians, and and so I ended up I ended up in in their office, and and part of the process that everybody who went to this physician uh, went through was to go through an audiologist. Um, just because there was an audiologist who was associated with the clinic and, mm-hmm. and he did hearing tests and did some research on, on uh, music and, and hearing loss. So, I, so that was my first exposure to it was while I was kind of going through this process where it was, it was clear I was going to have to change careers. Um, and so, and I had always, I had always, inter- I was always interested in, in languages and, and, uh, and physics. I was like physics. Mm. Um, so it kind of just, once I learned about it, it kind of just made sense that, that, that this might be, this might be a good, a good, uh, a good way to kind of use my skills a little bit. Um, but, but in something maybe that was, yeah, could make me a buck too. Yeah. And how, how did you... Unlike playing the trombone. I was going to say, how did you know you wouldn't make it as a professional trombonist? You know what? With the injury, first of all, I might not have anyway, but even with the injury, it was just, it was too much. Hmm. And uh, it was, I, and it was probably a good choice. 
Yeah. As you'll hear later when I play you the trombone. It's I'm not gonna I'm not gonna play very much trombone. <laughs> I don't know. I might hear it and think, oh, this guy should be touring no, the world. You're right. You know, I playing should not. stadiums. No. I should not. <laughs> guess what? No trombone players are touring the world playing stadiums. I, I guess so. I haven't seen many. <laughs> <laughs> um and so you've been at Conestoga about almost a decade now. Yep. How do you think this program has changed over the past decade, if it has? Oh, I think it's changed a lot. You know, one, I mean, one of the things we've, um, I think, you know, one of the things that probably people don't realize about, it's a weird, it's, this is a weird profession. So there is, uh, first of all, it's, it's healthcare, right? There's, there's definitely mm-hmm. a healthcare angle to it. There's yeah. also, there's also, if you've ever driven by, you know, one of the many hearing clinics out there, you'll notice that there's a bit of a, there's a bit of a retail element to it, yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, that's there's true. A, there's a product involved, and that product, you know, we're, we're providing that product in exchange for money. So mm. there's kind of like a salesy <laughs> sort of aspect to it. Um, but uh, uh, and the other thing is though that a lot of what we do, there's technical aspects, and hearing aids are really cool these days, and I'll do all these cool things. And and certainly there's technical aspects with respect to the testing. But a lot of what we do, or, or probably I would even say the bulk of what we do, is about communication. Mm. And it's about being able to, you know, in, in whatever, whatever, you know, whatever we're talking about, whether it's explaining results or, or sell and selling's a, a sell, say sell is about, it's a four letter word a little bit in this, but, but basically, you know, you want to convince people to be able to follow your treatment plan. Mm. Your treatment plan often will include this device, which costs a lot of money. Um, mm-hmm. so, so there's, there's a big communication element there. So one of the things I think we've, we've done, we, we've started doing the last few years is we start to use a uh, simulation. Ah. So a lot of the health, the healthcare professions use, use this, uh, simulation where we actually use, uh, standardized patients who are simply, yeah. they're typically elderly adults who come in and they're, they're not professional actors, but they, they play a role. Um, so we've been doing that a lot in the last, let's say, three or four years, and we hope to do even more of that as as um, um, as the the years go on. We're just trying to we were just sort of getting into it and trying it out, but uh, but it's it's great, and and we're I think we're the only truthfully I think we're the only HIS program, and I'm, I'm pretty sure we're probably the only uh, I would include audiology programs in North America who probably use this. Um, yeah, that. yeah. Which and so that's that's great. So I think that's probably the biggest thing. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly, we've upgraded our lab over the years as well. So we have a really nice lab now with with good equipment and things like that. So we have we have done, done a lot of upgrading over the years. Very cool. Well, I'm a huge fan. <laughs> um, full disclosure of kind of I'd call it role play or sort of yeah. simulation and learning. I find it one of the most powerful active learning tools. It really is. And, and we, we've always done it, but we've always done it in that, you know, we, always, we used to do it in, and we still do, but we, we in, the, in that kind of uh, student versus student yeah. role where you have to get the student to play one role and another student to play the clinician role. And, it, and it, we still do it and it's good, but, um, but it's really nice to be able to do this where, you know, it, because these standardized patients are are just like their patients they're going to be seeing when, yeah. they, when they get out in the world. And, and they don't have the knowledge that their, that their classmate has. Yeah, or pretending which, they don't or have in that moment they don't when they're have, in character. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, so it's tricky. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I'm teaching a, a series of courses, a micro-credential on role play in the classroom now oh, okay. for faculty at Conestoga. Oh, I should take that. Yeah, I'll sign you up. <laughs> um, but it is one of the things that comes up, right, is just the power of having these these live actors or simulated participants or patients come in. Yeah. It just raises the stakes, right? It feels more realistic. Um, yeah, you're not dealing with your peers and kind of laughing and, oh, you know, yesterday yes. we were eating pizza together and now you're <laughs> pretending right. to be this right. 70-year-old woman. And, and, and sometimes that's it's hard. It's hard to it's hard to for them to, to separate those two things out, I think. Yeah. And so have you found in these simulations, I imagine there's, you know, the technical part, someone has to explain what something is if, um, you know, the, the character doesn't know. Is there also a bit of interpersonal? You're talking a big oh, absolutely. Like, communication. And actually, usually that's what we're more interested in. Mm. Um, so, for instance, the simulated patient uh, may have to, I mean, here's an example. So one of the things we did, I did this a couple of weeks ago, um, the, the student had to teach the, the patient how to put a hearing aid in their ear. Oh, wow, okay. Which, you know, to us might sound stupid and you go, well, you just put it in your ear. But it's it's hard. Yeah. Um, and it's harder if you uh, have, uh, you know, a tremor or mm-hmm. you have arthritis in both your hands and you can't pick up small objects like batteries or mm-hmm. things like that. Hearing aids are really tiny, 
Yeah. And that's great, except that means <laughs> that it's it's difficult to do these things. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we'll do with with the standardized patients, because we provide them with a you know, with a, essentially a story. Mm -hmm. Um, and we can say, you know, you, I want you to have a tremor or I want you to, uh, you know, have arthritis, or I want you to maybe have the beginnings of, of, uh, some cognitive problems, Uh or you, we want you to get frustrated. Right. So so this happens all the time with patients where after you spend 15 minutes trying to get to the hearing aid in the ear, they get frustrated and yeah. they say, you know what, I can't do this. Yeah. Um, so it's it's how to how to how do students deal with those situations? And those to me, those are a they're they're I think those are the most difficult situations. Those are the most difficult aspects to 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 deal with yeah. um, compared to, let's say, actually literally just learning how to put a yeah, battery here's how in you a hearing battery aid. Battery I mean, that's, that's not that hard, but it's how to, how to deal with the, the issues that come out, that arise from that, I'd say. Yeah. So. And I mean, it's one of the things I love about those role play simulations too, right? Because the simulated participant coming in knows the backstory. They know they're going to have a tremor, but the student doesn't necessarily, right? right? Exactly. They just get, here's exactly. the stem, like you're going to meet us. And that is the key is to make sure that the students don't know that. Yeah. Right. And so then in the moment, it's like, there's often this, oh my goodness, uh, I thought I was just going to show them the technical thing yes. and now I have to coach exactly. them or like exactly. you know respond to these emotions. We have this one, this lovely woman who who comes in and I think last year she she literally got so frustrated that she started crying and walked mm. out of the room. Yeah. And uh, the students still talk about that to this day. So <laughs> Well, and that's what's so powerful, right? They can yeah. be so meaningful and so memorable these moments yeah, and it sure. feels so real, but then it's also in the safety of a classroom where someone hasn't just walked out without their hearing aid. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know that deep down that that you're going to debrief right. it exactly. together. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what we do. We debrief it afterwards and 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 I think they and then everyone learns. I mean, it's one thing about simulation is that you know, it's a bit time consuming mm-hmm. and if you have a lot of students, so so usually, you know, it's one student who's doing the simulation and everyone else is watching. But I think there's there's as much learning in the watching as there is in the in the actual doing as well. So Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm so I'm so happy to hear that <laughs> that you've added that into the program and it's going so well. Are there other changes that you've noticed even I don't know, technology wise over the past ten years, or has that been pretty pretty standard? Well, I have um, I have uh, you know clinician friends who tell me now. Is, uh, he's ask him how things are going. He says, "Well, I don't, I don't feel like a, I don't feel like an audiologist anymore or an HIS. I feel like a I feel like the Geek Squad guy from uh, <laughs> Best from Buy. Best Buy." <laughs> and, and that's because of like it, it, especially with respect to hearing aids, the mm. the things that have happened over the last ten years are 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 pretty pretty neat. Mm-hmm. Um, so manufacturers, so it's you know. It, certainly things like being able to connect your phone to your hearing aid so that oh. if you wear hearing aids, you can basically kind of Bluetooth your your uh, phone to your hearing aids, just like they would be just as if they were a headset. I didn't know so that was with your phone, well, th- And this has been around for a while. Hmm. Um, and, and now uh, there's things like manufacturers are doing things like um, uh, uh, putting a, a, a gyroscope in the hearing aid, which allows you to detect falls. So you can, if you fall down, if you're wearing the hearing aids and you fall down, it sends a signal to your phone that it, the phone needs to call their oh. significant other or whoever it is, um, uh, doing translation. So, so again, this is, this is kind of harnessing the power of the, of the phone itself. So the phone needs to be part of this, but, okay. but being able to, you know, if I go to a foreign country and I could say, Lauren, you could ask me a question in whatever language and and it would translate it into English for me. Really? Um, yeah, and even and even getting to health things where where you know there's information in the ear canal that uh, manufacturers are starting to exploit by um, putting sensor in the hearing aids themselves so that uh, so uh, uh, w- one that's that's kind of just coming out now is uh, is heart rate information. That so you can there's there's cardiac from the, ear canal? from the ear canal and then it will send the information again to the phone. So it's oh. things like that that are that are um, I mean, it's much different from when my, the first hearing aids I hit, I fit, which, which were pretty boring. <laughs> um, but a lot of this requires additional expertise on the the part of the clinician, which is which is expertise that's a little bit different than what we're maybe maybe we're we're used to. Yeah, you know, like we we always knew we'd have to you know learn how to do a hearing test or you know program a hearing aid, but but these things are a little bit a little bit extra. 
So. It's interesting. We did another interview with Jeff Oaks from Automotive, and he was saying something similar about cars that, right. like, you know, it used to be, yeah, you're changing an engine, you, you get your hands dirty, and now there's so many computer systems sort of within <laughs> within yes, the cars themselves. Exactly. The job description is changing. Exactly. Yeah, it's, 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 so it's, like, it's kind of an exciting time, really. Well, and I would imagine being here at the college, you're sort of on the cutting edge of this, right? We sort of have to have up-to-date technology yep. and, and know these trends. And, and and we have really good relationships with, with um, and the, there's, you know, there's seven or eight kind of big hearing aid manufacturers. Um, and a lot of their Canadian offices are actually within the Kitchener, Waterloo, Cambridge area. Wow. Um, so we have pretty good, and, and so we have pretty good relationships with them in terms of getting training from them and, and they'll come in and do, you know, do talks for the students and they'll provide us with products, whatever products we need. And that, that selling part of the job. <laughs> well, they're very interested in that <laughs> yeah. selling part of the job as you can, as you can imagine. So yeah, for sure. Uh, for sure. Wow. All right. Well, let's get into this lesson that, okay. um, yeah. So it's for an acoustics class, you said? Yeah, so so this is this is in the first term, first year. So there's two kind of I'd say there's two main, uh, I would call them you know core sort of background courses. So this is one acoustics where we talk about sound and and the um, uh, you know what is sound and and how does sound move and 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 uh, uh, how do we perceive sounds? That's a that's kind of part mm-hmm. of it, which is called psychoacoustics. Um, and then and then the other course is of course uh, anatomy and physiology. Which is looking more at the you know the the auditory system and how how we hear. Okay. Um, so these are kind of two. I'd say they're they're two basic courses that they need before they kind of go on to do to do other things. Okay. Um, and uh, and I have been teaching this one for since the since the beginning, just because I, I this is I kind of like this. This is mm. I, I enjoy I enjoy this. I don't know, it goes along and music. I was gonna say yeah, yeah your music, music background. And, this makes and a kind lot of sense. I've always liked physics and acoustics and 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 you know I'm no acoustician you know I am an audiologist so I'm not a physicist or an acoustician but um uh, uh but I've but it's just always been an area of interest to me yeah so, it seems a key part of it too so so that's that's the course and then and then what I thought I'd talk about just because um you know I, I let's face it I wanted to bring all these these things in. I'm so glad you did <laughs> um but uh we're going to talk about about resonance Okay. Essentially, and and more specifically, um, how uh, how sound reacts when we put it through a tube. Okay. And the reason, you know, wh- the, the 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 point of all this is that as uh, an HIS or an audiologist, you know, we're 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 using hearing aids. Some hearing aids have um, there's different styles of hearing aids. Um, there's styles of hearing aids where the the sound comes out of the hearing aid and it actually goes through a tube. Okay. So how does how does that how does how does the tube the acoustic properties of the tube how does that affect the sound? And um, that's not the case for all hearing aids. No, it's not anymore. Um, huh. uh, there there are specific ones that where it's probably more relevant, but even but even probably more relevant or more um, uh, relevant to, to this lesson is the fact that we also have our ear canals, mm. which in and of themselves are actually tubes. Right. So they actually have acoustic properties as well. So sometimes it's good to know what, like what, you know, how, how does, how do the acoustic properties of, of your ear canals and for those that your ear canals are, you know, what the, your, 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 the holes in your ear that lead to your eardrum, okay. how do the acoustic properties of that, you know, it, it could be having some knowledge of that can affect how we fit hearing aids. That makes and, sense. and it can affect testing and things like that. So having a little bit of knowledge of that is 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 useful for for what we do. I think. Okay, so this lesson. So how so it's sound, like yeah, yeah, how how sound you know what what happens um, mm-hmm. what happens when we introduce sound into tubes, and right. I usually start this by talking about um, talking about strings, okay. because it's it's relevant. It's not exactly the same thing, but it's but it's kind of relevant. So I brought my guitar here, Ooh. and I am not a guitar player. <laughs> Ross is pulling it out here. Uh, I'm gonna. Ooh. This is great. Second, I don't, I'm going to do this. Yeah, there you go. So, all right. So, guitar has strings, right? Uh huh. So, Lauren. Yeah. Lauren, I'm going to here now. I'm, I'm going to put my teacher voice on. Lauren. Okay. Yes. So, when I pluck this string, uh-huh. you hear a particular tone. I do. Yeah. So, what's happening is when I put energy into this. Actually, what it's actually doing is it's setting up waves along the string. You can't really see them, but it's actually mm-hmm. setting up waves that are going back and forth along the string. Okay, to okay? make the sound. But it's 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 making this particular sound, mm-hmm. right? There's a particular pitch that it's mm-hmm. that it's making. So why is it making that particular pitch? 
right? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna say what can I do to this string to make it make a different pitch? Like, Wait, okay, because I'm gonna limit you. Okay, you can't <laughs> touch the things at the end. Oh, that was gonna be my answer. You also cannot uh, change strings. We have to stay on the same string, and you also cannot put your fingers on any of the frets. Oh, you took my two answers. Okay, how could you change the pitch? And it's a trick question. Okay. I mean, my impulse would be, like, to play it much harder. And that doesn't change it, does it? What does that change? The volume. Yeah, it changes the volume. Yeah, I can definitely do that, but the pitch stays the same. Hmm. So, I mean, really, there's nothing I can do. Okay. This string wants to vibrate at this rate. Okay. So why is that? Well, there's there's a few reasons. So there are there are some things that I can do to change it. All okay. right? So, not, so one of the things is I can change the mass of the string. Right, mm -hmm. so this string has a certain thickness. So everyone's seeing on a guitar, you have certain some th some strings are thinner, yeah, less mass. Some are thicker, have more mass. Okay. So mm -hmm. this one has this much mass. So I'm going to go to one with more mass. So it's a thicker string. Okay. And I can do that. That sounds different. Uh -huh. Right. Now yep. I made it lower by going to more mass. I can go to a one that's thinner. So less mass, and that makes it higher. Much higher. All right, so by changing the mass, I can change the pitch, or I can change, really what I'm changing is the, the frequency of the waves running along the string. Gotcha. Okay, so that's mass. The other thing I can change is um, something we call tension or, or elasticity or stiffness. So that's what I can do with my little tuning pegs up here. Okay. So I'm going go to keep go back to my original string. If I change the stiffness, meaning if I make it more stiff or more tense. Ooh, there we go. I can also change it. Yeah. Right? If I make it less stiff or less dense, <laughs> I can make it I can make it go down. So more more stiffness, I can make the frequency go up. Yep. Less stiffness, I can make it go down. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Um, so those are so those are two things. So that that kind of really has to do with the um, the composition of the string itself, the mass and the stiffness, right? And we would call that the medium. That's like that's what the that's what the wave is running around, yeah. running along rather. It's running along this string. And if you actually if you if you got a a, a a camera and slowed it down and watched the string, you can actually see the little waves kind of moving along mm. the string. So there's one other thing I can do to to change this. Okay. And what is that? Mm. Oh, the actual frets. I'm allowed to say that now. Now you can do it. Okay. Sorry, sorry, I forgot to tell you. you, you <laughs> There's rules that in my now. head. I'm a good student. I'm uh, obedient. So what am I doing when I do that? You are uh, changing the note. You're, I'm changing yeah. the... But what am I doing to the string? Uh, you're making it shorter, yeah. essentially, because so you're I'm pressing down. Yeah, so I'm changing the length of the string. Right, okay. So right. that's the other thing. So those three things combined, basically the mass and the stiffness of the string and the length of the string, those are all going mm -hmm. to determine... Uh, the, uh, the 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 pitch of the or the or the frequency of vibration on the string. Gotcha. Okay? So mass, stiffness, length. Mass, stiffness, length. Okay. Exactly. Okay. I'm gonna put this down. Okay. Because we don't. There are no strings in hearing instrument specialist program. <laughs> okay. So now I'm gonna set up here. So now I gotta. I kind of gotta describe this. Okay. So I have a tuning fork. Yep. Okay. So a tuning fork is basically just a thing that when you hit it, it makes a makes a particular pitch. And we'll we'll take a picture and put it in the show notes for okay. those who. Uh, <laughs> um, I've got a tube. Okay. Right. It's just like a PVC tube, and uh, and then I've got a, a little Tupperware container with some water in it. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So if I hit the, I'll hit the tuning fork. Okay. Yeah. So that I don't know if you can hear it. I I sure can. So that is um, so it vibrates at a particular rate. And it actually has a frequency of 500 hertz, essentially, okay. which is basically C. Like okay. if you yeah. play piano, that's a C. Um, so, okay, fine. And I can't change that. And actually, like we go back to the guitar, this the, the reason this is vibrating at 500 hertz is because of the mass and the stiffness in the actual tuning fork itself. Right. Okay. okay? So if you had a smaller one or a less thick one. Then yeah. it would be higher or lower or whatever it is. Okay. But this one, I can't change that. Okay? okay. So now I'm going to send this sound from the tuning fork into the tube. Okay. And not much happens. Mm. Okay? Not much happens when I just put it into the tube. Right. Now I'm going to take the tube. I'm going to put the tube in the water. And basically I'm closing one end of the tube. Okay. And I'm going to do it again. But while I do it, I'm going to move the tube up and down in the water. 
Okay. Which is effectively change, like adjusting the length of the tube. Right, like the guitar frets kind of thing. Yep, okay. exactly. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna move it up and down, and you're gonna see what happens. Whoa. <gasps> so you can hear, and it's Whoa. pretty clear, right? Like it's actually fairly it's yeah. fairly um, so as it goes dramatic. deeper in the water, so yep. the tube is getting shorter, it gets louder. Yep. Right. Up to a point, but if I go too far, then it it. So mm -hmm. let's do it again. Oh, and then it gets quieter. Then it's quieter again. Look at that. There's like a... There's a magic length. Uh-huh. Right? So there's a magic length of this tubing which where, where the sound becomes louder. It basically is, is being amplified. Right. Right? Okay. So, so that's called resonance. So okay. basically the tube, when that happens, we can say that the, the, um, the tubes, when I'm at that length, here, I'll just go to that. Yeah. Right? It's pretty clear, right? Magic it's like it's a, there. Yeah. So when I'm at that exact length, we we can say that the resonant frequency of the tube is the same as whatever the frequency that we're playing into it. Okay, so okay? they match. Yeah. So they match, right? Gotcha. And and if I used a different length tube or a different a different tuning fork with a different frequency, then it's going to be it different. It would be higher or but, lower. Right. Oh, so for okay. this exact for this exact one though, we it found is the ex spot. it is exactly <laughs> this length of tubing that works. Wow. Okay, fine. So, um, so why does this happen? So, just like on the on the guitar, as I put sound into the tube, what's happening is the sound is going into the tube. It's going. It's 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 what we say um, propagating. So it's it's moving. Basically, okay. that's how sound moves. Mm -hmm. It's vibrating the molecules in the air, and it's going down to the end of the tube. So it travels down to the end of the tube, and when we get to the end of the tube, it actually bounces back. So well, it reflects. Yeah. So it goes this way, and then it goes this way, and it keeps going like this, back and forth, back and forth. Okay. Okay? And the waves that are going this way start to interact with the waves that are going this way. Hmm. So you get this interaction between the, the, the molecules that are being basically pushed back and forth by the sound. Gotcha. And at, at, at some random frequency, there's no real pattern to that, right, to that interaction. But at a particular frequency which in this case, with this length tubing and with this tuning fork, um, uh, you get this specific pattern that gets set up in the tube where um, the, the interaction between the waves causes what's called constructive interference, meaning that the waves just, they add up. Okay. So instead of, instead of just being, being all over the place and molecules just doing whatever they're doing, they're having this kind of random pattern, they're actually adding up, and that, ad that adding up of the sound waves causes an increase in the amplitude okay. or the volume. Wow. But again, it is very specific to this that tube frequency yep. and this, um, this length of tubing. Particular tube, okay. All right? So, and we can actually figure it out from a, from, a, from a math standpoint. You can say we can figure out for this tuning fork what the, uh, the wavelength is. And the wavelength is sort of, you know, how to do a complete... Uh, a cycle of the of the um, uh, the, uh, the the air molecules, uh -huh. let's say, like they're going one direction and then they're going back the other direction. There's a certain length, like literally a distance, that that will traverse. And for this, and it's it's related actually to the um, the properties of the medium, just like on the guitar. But yeah. the medium in this case is air. Right, wow. and air has mass, and air has stiffness as well. So we can use that, and we can actually calculate that the that the uh, um, the wavelength for this 500 hertz tone is actually 68 centimeters. Cool. So you could calculate yep. that without you, doing you, this actual experiment. Right. So and I know that the, I know that that wavelength for this because it because it's I know what the speed of sound is in air. I know the I know everything about the 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 medium, and I can say that I know that the that it's 68 centimeters. Neat. And if I go to this tubing and say, okay, well, at what length, at what length does that boost of sound occur, right? So I go here and I can say, all right, well, it's, it's right here. Right there. So if I had a ruler and I measured this, which I did, I would, won't now, but I, if I, I have already, I've already done you it. Did yeah. <laughs> and that is actually 17 centimeters. Cool. And if you figure that out, that is exactly one quarter of the wavelength of 
this 500 hertz sound. Wow. So there's that physics part that you, yes. you've always loved. That's all, and I can't go any more than that. Don't ask, don't ask me any other hard questions. Well, I'm, I'm barely following this. So. <laughs> so we actually call this thing a quarter wave resonator. Quarter wave resonator. A quarter resonator. wave resonator. And because it resonates, let's see, it, it resonates to sounds whose wavelength is basically four times the length of the tube. Okay. Right? Because the tube yep. is one quarter of the wavelength. Got you. So this is a quarter wavelength resonator that we just that we just built. Cool. Okay? And so that works with this, but certainly if you change the length of the tube, the tube's going to have a different res resonant frequency. Mm -hmm. Right? And that's where, like, that's where the trombone comes in. <laughs> right? And I I'll apologize. I should tell everyone this is a very... I apologize. This, this is my... <laughs> this is actually, it's called a P-bone, and it's made of plastic. It is a blue plastic trombone. A very neat and trombone. I'm going to take this off for a second. Okay. So so the thing about a trombone is, is like, it's pretty easy to see. This is true of all brass instruments, but as I, you change, as the I change the easily. slide, I'm, I'm changing the length. Like, just think of this as a tube. It's basically a tube. So as I change the slide, I'm changing the length of the tube, which means that it's now going to have a different resonant frequency. So that allows us to... So as the as the frequency as the sorry as the tube length gets longer, the resonant frequency goes down. Right. So longer tubes, lower uh, lower resonant frequency. Shorter tubes are going to have higher ones. That is so okay, neat. And I won't yeah. I won't punish anybody else. Any, and now does this relate? This. Say those you know our ears. Do yeah. people have different lengths? I guess they must. I don't yeah. know. So that's so that's there. I mean that's that's ex that's kind of exactly it. How right? we bring it back. So why do, like this is kind of why do we care? Right, because it's kind of cool, but but why do we care? And we care because, like I said, we use these tubes, right? We use tubes with hearing aids. Um, so knowing the properties of those tubes, knowing like w which frequencies they're going to amp amplify, uh. is is can be useful. And we can use we can actually use that um, and make adjustments based on you know what we need for that particular fitting. Right? And now let's say there's a child who's being fit with one of these hearing instruments yep. and then they grow. I assume their tubes get longer over right. time. They change, okay. right? right? So yeah, so let's talk about the ear canal. So the ear canal, so the average ear canal length is two and a half centimeters. Really? Yeah. So it's about one inch. So, but that's average and everyone's is a little bit different, right? Okay. Which means that those resonant frequencies can change from person to person a little bit. And that is useful information, again, when we're fitting hearing aids is to have some, to, to know exactly what are the properties um, of the ear canal or, or, and, 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 and I guess especially the specific ear canal that we're dealing with. Yeah. So the acoustic properties of our ears, and there's more, the ear canal is one aspect of those other aspects of it as well, but the acoustic properties of our ears vary from person to person. Uh -huh. And, and that is, that's important when we're fitting hearing aids to make sure we get a proper fit. Because you want that, that magic, that magic place, right? Yeah. That, you don't want to over amplify it at a frequency where you don't need it. <laughs> and you don't want to under amplify at a frequency where you do need it essentially. Uh -huh. Right. Thank you. Um, I think I think that's my I think that's my lesson. Well, that that's super, and uh, yeah, we we should wrap up soon because um, we could chat about this all day. That is really fascinating, Ross. Um, before we do uh, close off for today, I'm curious to hear if you have any kind of fun fact or quirky thing about you that your colleagues and students might not yet know. Um. You told me you're going to ask this, so I actually I did some thinking, okay. and, I, and the, the 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 first thing I came up with was that there's probably not because I'm a bit of an open book, <laughs> and my students know a lot about me, and they know about my kidney stones, and they oh. know about my two dachshunds, and they know about what sports teams I follow, uh, and they know that uh, they usually know what I'm going to be having for dinner that night, <laughs> and that I like to I, I have a I have a smoker, so I I do a lot of food smoking. Oh. So um, they they know all that. They know I, I live in Toronto, so I actually commute. Um, but I thought one thing they, they didn't, maybe they don't know is that I, when in Toronto, I actually live on a, uh, on the campus of a, uh, a private boarding school. Really? Yes, where my wife works and, and I've lived there for 14 years. No so way. I live in Toronto, but I, I live midtown Toronto, but I live, I live in, on a boarding school campus. Oh my goodness. So that and, is so neat. And I hate snakes. And you hate snakes. And I don't uh. like eggplant very much. <laughs> no. So that's Yeah, I'm not a huge eggplant fan no. myself. I don't eggplant know what it is. 
I like I like it aesthetically, but yes, it's, yeah, it's not beautiful. To eat. It yeah. is beautiful. <laughs> it's a beautiful. The color I really love, but uh, so that's that's it. And truthfully, yeah. they might have known that. I'm not really sure. Well, so. those are great. Those are great fun facts. Thank you, Ross. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you, you so much for being here. I certainly learned a lot. I was taking you. You told me to play student roles. So I was taking some copious okay, notes good. here. <laughs> that I hope I can decipher later on this evening. Um, I'll send you a quiz. Later okay, on. <laughs> my post assessment. Okay. Thanks, Ross. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, thanks for being here. Well, we have come to the end of another episode of My Favorite Lesson, a podcast hosted by Teaching and Learning at Conestoga College. You can find all episodes in this series and more by following Teaching and Learning at Conestoga on YouTube. You can also find this podcast on Spotify and other places you get your podcasts. If you subscribe, you'll be notified each time a new episode becomes available. For 24-7 support for all things teaching and learning related, please check out our Faculty Learning Hub at tlconestoga.ca. I'm Dr. Lauren Spring, reminding you, as the great Bell Hooks once said, that the classroom, with all its limitations, remains a location of possibility. Until next time.